guys and gals. Welcome back. This week is about synth stuff. I'm going to give you a nice easy overview of all of the different synthesis types that you're probably going to come across on your music journey. And lucky for us, they're all in that one amazing free plugin. Let's go. Okie dokie. So as you can see, we will be using the wonderful FreeSynth Vital for all of this, not only because it contains all the synthesis types that we need, but the visual design is really easy to follow along. And also the UI is completely rescalable, so we can go full screen on this, which is great. Okay, so before we get into the individual synthesis types, let me just go over what a synthesizer does in general. Now this doesn't just apply to Vital, this is going to be on any synthesizer you come across pretty much. So we should start with the bit that actually makes the noise, the sound, it's the oscillator or oscillators. Oscillation is just another word for vibration, of course. And as we know, if you vibrate something, it makes a sound. And if you vibrate that thing at a regular rate, you create a stable pitch or note. The things being vibrated here, in this case, or oscillated, are these waveforms. They have different shapes, and each one makes a different sound. Back in the analog days, these were created with electrical voltage, which is why they were called VCOs, Voltage Controlled Oscillators. You might see that written on other synthesizers instead of OSC. But as technology is ever-changing, now modern synths can create much more complex waveforms than the simple shapes that analog voltage used to generate. Okay, so other common parameters, we have envelopes. Now an envelope doesn't make any sound itself. Its job is to shape another parameter, and that shape is governed by the main four controls of attack, decay, sustain, and release. Most synthesizers have a dedicated envelope for volume, and Vital's first envelope is pre-applied there as well. For example, if I play a note with the sustain at max, it will sustain indefinitely. If I turn down the sustain, the note will decay at the rate of the decay parameter. The attack is for the beginning of the sound, how fast it fades in. And the release is for what happens after the note stops. Now envelopes can have other uses than just volume. Depending on the synthesizer, they can be applied to other things, usually the filter, but pitch also. Synthesizers differ in what they let you modulate and what they don't. One of Vital's big plus points is pretty much anything can affect anything else. In synth terms, it's what we call a modular synthesizer. The last thing you'll find on most synthesizers is an LFO, Low Frequency Oscillator. Now, don't let the name confuse you. These don't make any sound either. They're more like an envelope in the sense that they are just a shape which is designed to affect other things. But unlike an envelope, which has a start, middle, and end, LFOs are oscillators. They are continuously oscillating. So if I apply an oscillator to pitch, for example, we get vibrato. If I apply an LFO to volume, we get what's called tremolo. Right, synth types. We just program in a quick MIDI line that we can be listening to while we adjust. You know what sawtooth waves always remind you of? This classic. <laughs> but I don't think we can do that. 
can do something similar though. Let's go with that. Okay, synth types. Let's start with the easy one. Additive synthesis. What does that mean? Well, if we take a single oscillator like this, here's our saw wave, and we add another oscillator to it. Congratulations, you've just performed additive synthesis. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. It's not technically that simple. If we're going to get nerdy about this, additive synthesis means adding extra harmonics to a fundamental pitch. So if we start with a sine wave, and then add another sine wave, an octave up, and then maybe we do another one an octave above that. That would be additive synthesis. So technically the first additive synth was the Hammond organ, 1934, because that's how drawbar organs work. They stack sine waves on top of one another. Go and see my Crystal Waters video if you want some more on that. Let's move on to its much more popular cousin, subtractive. Okay, subtractive is just as easy a concept to follow. As soon as we take something away from the sound, or subtract, we're performing subtractive synthesis. So if I just turn the sustain knob down, we're subtracting volume over time, right? That's subtractive. The more common form of subtractive synthesis is probably with filters. So I can subtract high frequencies with a low pass filter or subtract low frequencies with a high pass filter. Or we can subtract low and high frequencies with the band pass filter. Very common form of subtractive synthesis. Obviously we can apply envelopes to those. Or low frequency oscillators. And if you think about it, sampling. What most samplers do is a form of subtractive synthesis because we start with a sound. And if I'm not adding to it, I have to take away, right? So I can take away volume with our envelope. I can take away frequencies with our filter. I can modulate those again with an envelope. All subtractive synthesis. We can all thank Bob Moog, I think, for bringing subtractive synthesis to the masses in the early 70s. While not the inventor, he was certainly the one to package it in the most useful format, i.e. less than the size of a house. <laughs> and with the Mini Moog in particular, he essentially set the template for the synths we use today. Okay, FM stands for Frequency Modulation. What's that all about? Well, we've had adding and subtracting so far. Then you can think of FM as a bit like multiplication. FM is all about the oscillators. At their core, they're no different. These are just sine waves, but the interaction is the difference. What we do is basically make one mess with the other. So as a recap, here's what it sounds like when we use additive synthesis to add just one more sine wave and octave up. So that's additive. Whereas if we take that second sine wave and we're going to make it mess with the first sine wave, modulate it, here's what that sounds like. Now the second sine wave is not turned up. What you're hearing is the effect of the second oscillator messing with the first one frequency modulating it. And because of that, we can change other things on the second to affect the first. So the pitch. Or the 
the waveform. And if any of this is sounding like a Sega Mega Drive or Genesis for you across the pond, that's no coincidence. That was the basis for its entire sound chip, FM Synthesis. FM was invented by John Chowning in the 60s, but it really came to popularity in 1983 when Yamaha licensed the technology off him to use in the legendary DX7 synthesizer. And as a result, the whole 80s decade was really bright <laughs> because we suddenly went from synths that were subtracting things away to these really bright FM DX7 patches. Right, so wavetable. Now we're up to date, right? Wrong. <laughs> you think wavetable is a recent thing? No, no, no. It was invented in the late 50s, actually, by Max Matthews. The revolution with wavetable synthesis was that before wavetable, oscillators had a fixed function. So you would select your waveform like sine or saw, and you would modulate those using external means. Whereas a wavetable synth could store many, many, many waveforms in a single oscillator, basically as a table of contents, thus the name table. And then that table could be scanned between or modulated very much like another synth parameter. Like that. It was popularized later on by the likes of Waldorf with the PPG wave. And then later on again with the Korg wave station. Now what we have today in the likes of Serum and Vital, in my opinion, is much closer to what we call granular synthesis, which is very similar. So let's look at that. Okay, so I've extended some of the MIDI notes on our line here, just so I can show you this next one. But the difference between wavetable synthesis and granular synthesis is not much. The only difference is instead of a table of different waveforms that we can scan through, we have a continuous bunch of samples like we do in a normal audio file. For example, if I take this kick drum, I can turn that into an oscillator. Obviously there's a time element to this audio sample. It's not just fixed in time. There's thousands and thousands of samples over a couple of hundred milliseconds. You can see this much easier on the 3D display. Let me just reverse the direction that's being modulated in. So here's our kick drum as an oscillator. And we can select any point in time at a sample level, at a granular level, which is where the name comes from. We have control over this waveform. I could choose random points in time. It's an oversimplification, but granular synthesis is basically the granular control over the samples in a dynamic oscillator. Now, granular synthesis is a little bit more modern than Wavetable in the sense that it was popularized a lot more recently, but it still was invented in the 60s. It was called Yanis Xenaxis, and he first achieved it using tape splicing, can you believe? Right then, that's going to do it for today. I hope you found that helpful, or at least fascinating. If you did, you know what to do. Hit like or subscribe, and let me know in the comments what your favorite synths are. And obviously, leave any questions, I will get back to you. Until next time, bye-bye.